committee uh, hearing will come to order. Uh, before I uh, begin opening statement, just one uh, apologize for the uh, slight delay in starting. And um, what I anticipate is um, on a time sense is that we will get uh, through um, any uh, opening statements from me and the ranking member and our witnesses. We are likely going to have a single vote uh, about that time. We will break, go over and vote, come back and then do a Q&A um, after that vote. So we will try to be as efficient as we can, so uh, not to keep you any longer than necessary, but <laughs> glad to have our discussion. Uh, as an oversight committee, we exist to secure two fundamental principles. First, Americans have a right to know that the money Washington takes from them is well spent. And second, Americans deserve an efficient, effective government that works on their behalf. Our duty on the Oversight and Government Reform Committee is to protect these very important rights. Our solemn responsibility is to hold government accountable to taxpayers because taxpayers have a right to know what they get from their government. We will work tirelessly in partnership with citizen watchdogs to deliver the facts to the American people and bring genuine reform to the Federal bureaucracy. This is the mission of the Oversight and Government Reform Committee. Today's hearing on improper statements continues our subcommittee's examination of Federal financial management issues. It also affords us the first opportunity to review the newly enacted Improper Payments Elimination and Recovery Act of 2010. I welcome our witnesses and thank them for their efforts in both your written testimony that you have provided as well as your testimony you will provide here today. The Honorable Danny Werfel is the Controller and Director of the Office of Federal Financial Management at the Office of Management and Budget, and Kay Daly is the Director of Financial Management and Assurance at the Government Accountability Office. We are grateful for both of you being part of this hearing. As millions of Americans file their income taxes today, and because of a holiday here, they have a couple extra days uh, through Monday, through the 18th, as opposed to the traditional April 15th. It is important for those of us in the Federal Government to take a step back and remind ourselves of the responsibility we have to spend those tax dollars wisely. First and foremost, that responsibility means we need to make sure that funds are being spent the way they are intended to be spent. Unfortunately, the total dollar amount of improper payments, which could be anything from payments without documentation to outright fraud, is staggering. As both of our witnesses note in their written testimony, Federal agencies reported an estimated $125.4 billion in improper payments during the fiscal year 2010. As a point of reference, the President requested $125.1 billion to fund the entire Department of Veterans Affairs in 2012. I well remember conducting a hearing back in May of 2003 when the estimated improper payments was $35 billion. It is important to be clear that the increases year after year are, in fact, a result of better detection and reporting. That is a very good thing because it shows we are identifying the problem. The fiscal year 2010 financial report actually found that the estimated error rate went down about a half of a percentage point. That being said, we still have a responsibility to the people paying their taxes today to do the best we can in handling the hard-earned funds. The total amount of improper payments is thus very troubling. Even with the small drop in the error rate, the dollar amount increased by $16 billion, enough to fund the FBI, the DEA, and the United States Marshal Service for one year. In response to these concerns, this committee played a key role in the passage of the Improper Payments Elimination Recovery Act. And I certainly recognize um, then Chairman of the Full Committee, Mr. Towns, for uh, his committee's leadership and work on this issue. The purpose of IPERA was to strengthen agency, performance, uh, agency governance practices by incorporating a more stringent risk and performance framework for agencies to measure program outcomes. It expands the use of recovery audits and business analytics to help agencies recoup improper payments. These are common sense changes that build on prior requirements. Focusing on eliminating improper payments goes to the very heart of accountability. I believe the American people are looking to us for action and solutions. And I was pleased to see that both of our witnesses point to examples of success stories in your testimony. 
And I like this hearing to be about those types of successes, about solutions. Technology is certainly a part of the solution, and we have access to tools that weren't even invented when the Improper Payments Information Act was passed in 2002. Tools such as continuous transaction monitoring and business intelligence can help the government move towards a, quote, prevent and detect, unquote, model, rather than the old pay and chase scheme. But technology can only go so far. As always, sound internal controls are the bedrock for any successful, sustainable, and cost-effective solution. Agencies need to understand that the root causes of errors and develop better controls to prevent or detect them before the money goes out the door. One way to improve internal controls is to have a third party evaluate them. And I was pleased to see your testimony address the issue of shifting audit resources to provide more scrutiny for payment activities. Mr. Werfel, I see that you make reference to the upcoming report on the CFO Act in your testimony, and I am looking forward to those recommendations to get additional ideas on how to better leverage our audit resources to focus more on accountability and internal controls. Again, I thank you for your uh, appearance here today and look forward to your testimony. And with that, I yield to the distinguished ranking member, Mr. Towns, for his opening statement. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Um, uh, let me thank both of you for your service. Um, this is a very important and timely hearing, and I thank you for holding it, Mr. Chairman. Um, Mr. Werfel, it is good to see you again. And Ms. Daly, welcome. I am looking forward to your testimony as well. Even as the economy begins to recover from the last recession, the Federal Government still faces fiscal challenges in cutting spending and raising revenue. This subcommittee is continuing to explore ways the government can save money and close the deficit. Uh, Mr. Werfel, <coughs> the last time you visited with us, you gave us an excellent overview of the current financial conditions of the Federal Government as we looked at the consolidated financial statements. Today, we focus on the reduction of improper payments. We look to you and Mrs. Daly to provide us with deeper insights on how we can quickly begin to conserve our financial resources by eliminating and recapturing improper payments. President Obama's administration has put forth very robust initiatives to eliminate improper payments, which is one of the key components of the efforts to eliminate waste. I am encouraged to see that we have some positive results in response to these efforts. The President called for a do not pay list in June 2010 so that we don't keep giving money to the same ineligible recipients repeatedly. We now have the verifypayment.gov website, which allows agencies to check recipients' eligibility before they receive their Federal payments. This is a great beginning, and I would like to hear more about this effort today. The President also asked agencies to be transparent about the amount of improper payment and to account to the American public for their action in addressing these problems. I am pleased to see that we now have the paymentaccuracy.gov website that shows exact information. This is also a very good response. President Obama signed the Improper Payments Elimination and Recovery Act of 2010 into law last July. That law became effective in January 2011. I am looking forward to hearing about our progress under the new law as well. A healthy financial future for the United States requires sustained effort for more than one source. We must work together. We have to watch what we spend, get rid of waste, increase revenue, and reduce improper payments, all at the same time to accomplish this goal. I am looking forward to working on a bipartisan way to reduce and to capture and to eliminate <coughs> improper payments. On that note, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. 
Thank the gentleman and uh, certainly look forward uh, as well in uh, that bipartisan uh, fashion to work together within uh, the committee as well as with our executive branch colleagues. And with that, I yield to the gentleman from Virginia, Mr. Connolly, for an opening statement. Thank you, uh, Chairman Platts. And I want to thank you for holding this hearing to assess progress in reducing improper payments. Although this is a common topic of inquiry, sustained oversight can produce dividends for taxpayers by highlighting progress and identifying other opportunities for improvement. Congress and the administration have focused on reducing improper payments. President Obama issued Executive Order No. 13520, Reducing Improper Payments. President Obama also ordered that a Do Not Pay list be created to avoid repeated improper payments and issued two memoranda to agencies to provide guidance in reducing improper payments. Despite these efforts, improper payments grew by $16 billion in fiscal year 2010, indicating the need for further action. Therefore, Congress continued to ramp up efforts to reduce improper payments. During the last session, Congress included language to reduce improper Medicare payments in the Affordable Care Act, saving up to $80 billion annually. Congress also passed the Improper Payments Elimination and Recovery Act, as Mr. Towns just indicated, introduced by former Congressman Patrick Murphy and co-sponsored by many members, including yourself, Mr. Chairman. IPARA expanded reporting requirements and improved agencies' ability to recover improper payments. Many of IPARA's provisions became effective in FY 2011, so we will need to continue monitoring its implementation to see how well it works and whether it can be strengthened. In his written testimony, Mr. Werpel, a familiar figure now here in this committee, uh, I think we need to make him an honorary member at some point, Mr. Chairman, uh, estimates the successful implementation of improper payment reduction programs could save $160 billion over 10 years. So there are substantial cost savings. There is evidence we already are making progress. While the total amount of improper payments grew during the last fiscal year, the improper payment rate across the Federal Government actually fell from 5.65 percent to 5.49. While that still is far too high, it is important to recognize the progress agencies have achieved as this reduction in improper payment rates saved taxpayers $4 billion and is progress upon which we can build. I want to again thank you for holding the hearing, and I look forward to hearing the testimony. Thank the gentleman. Uh, we will now move to uh, opening statements uh, of our witnesses. And again, we have the Honorable uh, Daniel Werfel, Controller and Director of the Office of Federal Financial Management, the Office of Management and Budget. And uh, we certainly would be honored to have him as, a, as an honorary member. Uh, whether he would be willing to associate himself with us, I am not sure. But, um, but also, uh, Ms. Kay Daly, from the, uh, as Director of Financial Management and Insurance at the um, United States Government Accountability Office. And, and we are always um, delighted and, and grateful to partner with GAO as well on your important work. Uh, it is the um, practice of the committee to swear in all witnesses before testimony. So if I could ask you to rise and raise your right hand. Do you solemnly swear or affirm that the testimony you are about to give this committee will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Thank you. Uh, the record will reflect that both witnesses answered in the affirmative. Um, again, we are grateful for your testimony. Mr. Werfel, if you would like to begin. Thank you. Chairman Platts, Ranking Member Towns, Congressman Colony, and distinguished members of the subcommittee, uh, thank you for inviting me to testify today. I appreciate the opportunity to discuss the Federal Government's current efforts to prevent, reduce, and recapture improper payments as well as how the audit process can be improved to focus on key programmatic issues like payment errors. As has been discussed, in fiscal year 2010, Federal agencies estimated that approximately $125 billion in improper payments were made to individuals, organizations, and contractors. And although not all errors represent fraud, all payment errors degrade the integrity of government programs and compromise citizens' trust in government. As part of the Administration's Accountable Government Initiative, we have set aggressive goals to prevent $50 billion in improper payments and recapture at least $2 billion in improper payments between fiscal years 2010 and 2012. In addition to the enactment of IPERA, the Administration is taking numerous steps to prevent, reduce, and recapture improper payments. First, as mentioned earlier, in November 2009, the President issued an executive order dedicated to the sole purpose of reducing improper payments. The order drives transparency, increased agency accountability, and new incentives for State and local governments to reduce error. 
Second, last June, the President issued a memorandum to agencies on enhancing payment accuracy through a Do Not Pay list, as Congressman Towns just referenced. The Do Not Pay list will serve as a single source through which all agencies can check the status of a potential contractor, grantee, or individual beneficiary by linking the agency to relevant eligibility databases, such as the Social Security Administration's death master file and the General Service Administration's excluded party list. The initial portal has been built. However, full implementation of this initiative will be done over several phases, including where we are right now, which is currently pilot testing the solution with Federal agencies. As envisioned, the Do Not Pay list, when fully operational, will not just be a data match tool, but will leverage cutting-edge fraud technology, fraud detection technology, to further reduce the number of improper payments. Third, in March 2010, the President issued a memorandum to agencies directing them to intensify and expand their efforts to recapture error. We have set a goal of recovering at least $2 billion in improper payments between fiscal year 2010 and 12. I am pleased that in this area we are making significant progress in meeting this goal, as agencies reported in fiscal year 2010 that they had recaptured $687 million in improper payments, which is a nearly 300 percent increase from prior recoveries. As you can see, we are working towards preventing and recapturing improper payments across the government. However, we are continuously looking for better and more creative ways to address these challenges. For example, our financial statement audit results address whether the agency has the appropriate accounting in place to record that a payment has occurred. However, the audit opinion too often stops short of scrutinizing the integrity of that payment. This leads to a result where there is no correlation between an agency's ability to obtain a clean audit opinion on their financial statements and an agency's ability to mitigate instances of improper payments. I believe an important improvement that should be considered as we reexamine our Federal reporting model is holding the agency accountable as part of their financial statement audit for reporting the various root causes and components of their payment errors identifying those error areas of error that are within their direct and immediate control for the agency to mitigate, and then having the auditor evaluate whether the agency has taken sufficient action to mitigate the risk associated with such errors. I believe this proposed change would reinforce the Federal financial community's current focus and ongoing commitment to improving results in this area. I want to thank you again for inviting me to testify, and I look forward to answering any questions that you have. Thank you, Mr. Werfel. Uh, Ms. Staley. Thank you, Chairman Platts, Ranking Member Towns, and Congressman Connolly. I appreciate the opportunity to be here today to discuss the government-wide problem of improper payments in Federal programs and agencies' efforts to address key requirements of the Improper Payments Imp Information Act of 2002, commonly referred to as IPIA. For fiscal year 2010, 20 agencies reported improper payment estimates for over 70 programs that totaled over $125 billion. This is an increase from the fiscal year 2009 estimate of about $109 billion, primarily due to increases in estimated improper payments for four major programs, unemployment insurance, earned income tax credit, Medicaid, and Medicare Advantage. The agencies administering these programs reported that the increases in the estimates were primarily attributable to an increase in program outlays. That was the case for Medicaid and Medicare Advantage programs, even though those two programs reported lower error rates. Both the unemployment insurance and earned income tax credit programs reported higher program outlays and higher error rates for fiscal year 2010 when compared to fiscal year 2009. Although overall improper payments rose by about $16 billion, we view this as a positive step because it indicates that agencies have increased their efforts to identify and report improper payments, which will ultimately improve transparency over the full magnitude of the improper payment problem. And this is a critical first step in establishing effective accountability measures to reduce them. 
Some agencies reported they had made progress to reduce improper payments in their programs and activities. Since initial IPIA implementation in 2004, we found that more programs are reporting every year and that 17 agency programs that had reported improper payment error rates from between 2004 and 2010 reported reduced error rates in those programs. While those, these error rate reductions are promising, some major challenges do remain. For example, we found that the $125 billion improper payment estimate did not reflect the full scope of improper payments across all agencies. Seven programs that had been identified as susceptible to risk of improper payments, with 2010 outlays totaling about $85 billion, did not report an estimate. Uh, which had uh, most notably of these is the Medicare Prescription Drug Benefit Program, which had outlays of about $59 billion in 2010, but has not yet reported a comprehensive estimate of improper payments. It, the program does expect to do so in fiscal year 2011. Now, during fiscal year 2010, there were a number of actions taken intended to strengthen the framework for reducing and reporting improper payments. As we have all noted, the President signed the executive order in November 2009 to increase transparency and accountability for improper payments, and the President also issued two memorandum in June and March that re were intended to expand efforts to recapture improper payments and also use recovery audits, in addition to establishing a do not pay list. The President also set the goal to reduce improper payments overall by $50 billion and to recapture at least $2 billion by the end of fiscal year 2012. In addition, in July 2010, the Improper Payments Elimination and Recovery Act, commonly referred to as IPERA, was passed and is intended to enhance reporting and reduction of improper payments. IPERA established additional requirements related to Federal manager accountability recovery auditing aimed at identifying and reclaiming payments made in error, and compliance and noncompliance determinations based on an Inspector General's assessment of whether an agency is meeting IPERA requirements. For example, uh, IPERA requires agency managers and the programs to be held accountable for achieving the agency's goals. So in closing, we recognize that measuring improper payments and taking action to reduce them are not simple tasks. The ultimate success of the government-wide effort to reduce improper payments hinges on each Federal agency's diligence and commitment to identify, estimate, determine the causes of, and take corrective actions to reduce improper payments. So, Mr. Chairman, Ranking Member Towns, and Rep Representative Connolly, I would like to thank you for providing me the opportunity to be speak before you today, and I also ap appreciate your commitment to addressing this serious problem. And I would be pleased to respond to any questions you may have at this time. Thank you um, for your testimony, and uh, appreciate both of you sharing your knowledge and insights. Uh, I yield myself five minutes for the uh, first uh, round of questions. Um, certainly appreciate the headway that we have uh, made. Uh, and since uh, former Chairman Steve Horn authored the original Improper Payments Information Act and, and got us on a good track to where we are today, uh, almost 10 years later, and it seems that we certainly are doing a much better job, as I uh, referenced in my statement and, and you both have as well, that we are now identifying the amounts and, and therefore knowing what to go after. Uh, but it's still pretty significant. Um, Mr. Warfel, in your, your testimony, you reference in your written testimony um, that uh, not all errors uh, are fraud. In fact, uh, most, uh, quote, most payment errors are inadvertent, and then further say not all errors are waste. In fact, quote, significant amount of error is based on missing documentation. Uh, how would you um, roughly calculate percentage if it's if it's not fraud, it's not waste, it's inadvertent and maybe missing documentation. Is that 50 percent of that 125 number? Is it um, 75 percent? Uh, we have a couple answers there. First, in terms of the overall error portfolio, we think about a third associates to the lack of appropriate documentation. And what that means is we go down and we audit or sample uh, the payment and test its accuracy, and the, the people involved cannot provide us the relevant information for us to do an appropriate validation of whether the payment was accurate or not. 
and under longstanding audit principles, we don't assume the best, we assume the worst, and we characterize that as an error. And that is about a third. What happens, though, is, some, is later on, as that documentation improves, we find that not all of those payments turned out to be error. It, it reverts back to the general error rate that we see in government programs, which is about, about 5 percent. Um, your other question about fraud is something that we are looking at, but we don't yet have an exact percentage. What we see in the other two-thirds of the problem, and, and I am being very general right now, is uh, most often the problem is a, uh, an inability to validate eligibility or, or authenticity, whether data matches that should be occurring are not occurring, or whether there really is at this time no third-party data source to validate um, the current situation. Um, and in some cases, uh, it turns out that our inability to validate eligibility is driven by the fact that we are actually being defrauded, that someone has set up a fake uh, identity or a fake account of some kind. We believe, based on all the information that we have, that that is, that is a, a serious problem, but it is not a large percentage of the problem. We just don't have the exact percentages at this time. In order to do so, it would take a different approach to our measurement that, uh, that would involve a lot of resources and the community as a whole is considering uh, and continues to consider whether to establish a particular fraud metric, and it would be interesting to hear the the interest of this uh, subcommittee on that topic as well. And I, I assume, in the area of of improper documentation, that it's safe to believe that a lot of that relates to programs that are state administered, um, where such as Medicaid, where the verification is not done by a Federal entity, but a, a partner at the State or local level. Is that a, a safe it is, it is a significant problem in, in State administered programs. Um, in particular, you have 50 different uh, administrations of the program, 50 different approaches. Um, and so we see that sometimes the controls and the documentation and the rigor with which programs are carried out at the State level vary greatly. Um, and that is one of the areas. And, and you are right, we do not have as direct immediate control over how those States are running their operations and what kind of internal controls they are putting in to maintain good documentation. And that is why it becomes very significant. On a, on a specific program, uh, the idea of whether it is more fraud or inadvertent lack of documentation, uh, Medicare fee-for-service, uh, you reference in your testimony um, uh, the President's efforts to really go after uh, improper payments in this category, and, and certainly a good sign going from an estimated 12.4 percent um, uh, to now 10.5 uh, percent, I believe. Um, in that specific program, um, I guess, what was the most significant change or effort that got us from over 12 to now over 10, so we are coming down? And how would you categorize that issue of fraud versus just inadvertent or you know, lack of documentation? Well, it is a very good question. Um, Medicare is the largest source of error in the Federal Government, um, and it is it's, uh, obviously the top priority of the Administration to address that, because as we address and do a better job on that, the, the whole government-wide error rate and improper payment problem shrinks. In terms of how I will take your, your first question, in terms of how they have been able to improve. The Medicare program, the folks at CMS have had a, an ongoing and longstanding corrective action plan that continues to move forward and continues to get refined, and they continue to make more and more progress. And it has multiple elements to it. They are holding providers more accountable for documentation. They are uh, working with the provider community to understand what they are required to maintain in terms of documentation. So that problem is there. But there are other elements to the Medicaid error, whether it is they are doing a better job at, uh, at identifying coding errors. For example, they reimburse for a, uh, an MRI, but only a chest X-ray occurred. Well, we just reimbursed for a $4,000 procedure. Uh, when it, only a $1,000 procedure occurred. These, these sometimes are coding errors, and, and they are building better automated solutions and contractor review modules that can pick up on these things. But I think the real, the real driver here and the real most promising benefit to Medicare 
is their predictive modeling and their business intelligence and analytics to, to identify procedures that just look anom anomalous and activities mm -hmm. that look anomalous. And as the information age emerges, uh, we just become better at detecting these different trends um, with the data. And sometimes there is there's a, a, legitimate, a legitimate provider there who didn't realize that the um, activities that they have conducted are, uh, are technically not Medicare eligible, and we need to train those medical providers better. In some cases, it is fraud. The, uh, and I want to yield to the member just to conclude on that specific point of the business, the analytics, and, yeah. and, and doing better. Uh, you know, this is something that the, the credit card industry is you know, yes. way ahead of probably us. Um, Absolutely. How are um, the you know, OMB specific or departments individually uh, trying to reach out to the private sector? Uh, Discover card. I, I'm a, a big guy in Discover. No, you know, no annual fee. I paid in full every month, it's like cash back. But it's something like um, each year. My my wife has uh, chaired the teacher appreciation program at our local elementary school, and one of the things was then through the PTA to go out and do a, a gift card for each teacher. And my wife Leslie would go out and purchase some for the whole school, all the faculty, and then is reimbursed by the PTA when they're provided. So there's a big charge, you know, kind of out of the norm. I actually get a phone call from Discover, because my cell is the, 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 the number of record, saying, hey, you know, a big charge has just been made five minutes ago. Is, if there's a problem with this and you didn't authorize it, let us know right away. Mr. Chairman, I, I would like that system that I got a call every time my wife put a big charge on the credit card. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, I do um, sometimes, um, uh, and uh, not uh, not in any uh, distrust in, of, of my wife's spending habits, but uh, <laughs> discover. But it's an example of them saying, "Hey, something's out of the ordinary," uh, because of the amount of the charge. Um, th those things hap happen when I make the charge too, Mr. Dunn. <laughs> Connolly, sorry. Well, that's what I meant. Uh, <laughs> how, you know, how are we doing as a government? in trying to replicate and not reinvent the wheel, but use the expertise of the private sector who had a real financial incentive to do this, who have gone out and are doing it very well. Are, are we reaching out to the private sector, or are we trying to reinvent the wheel instead of learning from what they have done? Uh, it is an excellent question, and it is, to me, one of the more exciting opportunities that we have. I said, I used the phrase earlier, leveraging the information age at this problem. That is a mantra that I have tried to uh, promote within the community around this area. But to answer your question more directly, one of the, I think we are going to look back and see one of the more critical moments in the history of our journey on improper payments as being the creation of the Recovery, Accountability and Transparency Board and some of the innovative things that have been going on at that board. They, they are, have really been serving as a major bridge between these cutting-edge solutions, whether it is in the credit card industry or counterintelligence or otherwhere, and saying these solutions can be used in programs like Medicare and Medicaid. Um, and they demonstrated that during the Recovery Act, where we started to get wind of some of the things they were doing by using data that was out there in the public sphere, gathering enormous quantities of data in real time and then using very sophisticated and well thought out algorithms and questions and queries of the data to start saying, hey, here is looking at this payment, it looks fine when I look at it like this, but with the data I am going to twist it on its axis a bit, and suddenly there is a bunch of red flags there. Um, and we were basically wowed by what they were able to do. So we started bringing in more and more agencies. They are actually telling us they, they don't know what they are more busy doing, finding fraud or demoing the solution to other agencies, which I think is a great problem to so have. So that, that resource that they are serving is kind of a clearinghouse to, to educate and train Department and agencies to replicate what they're doing. Right, and so one of the one of the major moments uh, and aha moments was we brought CMS in, and they saw the solution. Now they have a forensic unit at CMS that does a good job, um, a very good job. But they so they challenged the recovery board and they said, "Here's a bunch of data." and we know where the fraud is within this data. Let's see if you can find it. And not only did the recovery board find it, they found fraud that CMS had missed. Uh, 
and they did it using uh, just a, a better and more comprehensive and a different type of algorithm. CMS is very good, for example, at finding um, providers with unusual treatments. Like, here is this provider in Texas who had seven of these types of treatment in the last few weeks, and that is unusual. You, you normally don't see that kind of treatment out of a small provider. And they forensically look at that stuff well. But what the Board's tool did was it found identity fraud. It found a doctor in Texas using a license of a legitimate doctor in North Carolina and saying, this doctor really doesn't exist. And that in the CMS uh, algorithm and, and forensics they, they had missed. Well, the goal here is now they shouldn't miss it anymore. And so now CMS is creating a fraud lab where they have different types of people now with different perspectives and expertise, including some of the recovery board expertise, driving to improve their overall algorithm. It is fantastic. It is going to take time before we see the full impact of the results, but it is already generating, you know, they already have an investigation underway with the Inspector General around a fraud ring that was discovered through this. So it is uh, exciting. Great. Good, good news uh, that we are heading in the right direction. I appreciate my colleagues. Uh, uh, understanding with going a little over uh, or well over my time, but yield to the ranking member. You the chairman. <laughs> <laughs> uh, let me begin by, uh, by Ms. Daly. Uh, can you explain to me what a payment recovery audit is? Yes, sir. Uh, payment recovery audits are actually audit tools, although they are not audits in the true sense of the word, typically performed by contractors who specialize in this area. They comb through invoices and other documentation that an agency maintains, and they identify actually improper payments that are in there, and they actually go out and recoup those improper payments. They typically work on a contingency fee basis, so therefore it is little cost to whoever is employing them. And these payment recapture audits or recovery audits are actually performed not just in the Federal Government, but in State and local governments, and then also in the private sector. And both of you in your testimony um, discussed the annual increases in improper payments. Uh, you said the government started out with $45 billion and reported improper payments in 2004. And then the, you said seven years later, actually, um, indicates that um, it was $125 billion in improper payments. Uh, that represents probably what is about a $70 billion increase in six years. Uh, can either of you explain the cause for the major increase? I think the, the biggest cause is, uh, is just more programs reporting. When we first started on this journey after the Improper Payments Information Act was enacted in 2002, one of the first lessons learned was measuring error in programs isn't easy. Uh, it, it requires resources, it requires expertise, it requires creating um, partnerships with your funding recipients who now have to be subjected to these payment audits. And, and so it took us a while on the learning curve to figure out the right way and the appropriate way to measure a number of programs. So that $45 billion that you referenced, Congressman, uh, takes into account a smaller footprint of programs. So what happened each year is we had the good news of, okay, we have measured three more programs, let's add their error in. The next year we measure in five more programs, let's their, add their error in, and the error rate and the error amount grows. The other cause is outlays. We outlay significantly more money in 2010 than we did in 2004. So even if the error rate stays constant at, you know, at 5 percent, um, if you are going from $100 to $1,000 to $100,000, even at a 5 percent error rate, the improper payment amounts go up. So those are the two causes, without making any excuse, because all of these, we still have a $125 billion problem that we need to solve. I have explained to you why it is increasing, but, uh, but we, we need to be very, very focused on how to, uh, on how to start turning that tide back the other way. Mr. Werfel, uh, IPER included many important provisions aimed at reducing proper payments. One provision relates to sanctions for programs that are not complying with the law. 
Specifically, if any agency has been determined not to be in compliance for two consecutive years and the Director of OMB determines that additional funding would help the agency come in to compliance, the head of the agency shall obligate additional funding in an amount determined by the Director to intensify compliance efforts. Would you please explain how you will determine what needs to be done at the agency level? It's, it's going to be challenging. I mean, I think one of the most important things that IPERA does that I'm, uh, I'm most excited about is it really integrates the Inspector General into this problem more than they have been into the past. Because the compliance finding that you just described, two years of noncompliance, is based on a conclusion that is reached by the Inspector General. And I am hopeful that in reaching that conclusion, the Inspector General is going to provide us some degree of a roadmap in terms of where some of the deficiencies are occurring and where the investments are needed. I also think the agencies themselves um, on, the, on the management and on the payment side are also very dedicated to this. So my, my vision is if we get to a place where we have an Inspector General who defines an agency or finds an agency has been noncompliant for two consecutive years, that we are going to come to the table with OMB, the agency and the Inspector General and have a good, strong diagnosis of where the money can best be spent to improve, where is the most positive return on investment. It is not going to be easy, but I think with the right partnership, uh, we should be able to find the answers more often than not. No. My time has expired. Yeah, I, I, I can't yield back because I don't have any, right? <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank, thank you, uh, Mr. Towns. Uh, now I yield to the gentleman from Virginia, Mr. Connolly. Thank you so much, Mr. Chairman. And I, I really want to thank you for having this hearing because I, uh, this is the kind of public policy thing I love to see, sink my teeth into, and I look forward to working with you on follow-up legislation uh, because I think this is a really promising area. Not all of the Federal budget or Federal deficit lends itself to promise. This one does. Um, I'm going to ask as many questions as I can fit in, so please try to be concise and bear with me. But, um, Mr. Werpel, if I understood your testimony, you talked about $125 billion in improper payments, I think, made last year. You said that there was a goal to recapture $2 billion, if I heard you correctly. That seems awfully modest. Yeah, the, the reason, I will try to be as concise as I can, is the, the, the real sweet spot for where you can recover error is recovering improper payments to vendors. Uh, the reason is is because the measurement that we have is is real. Every 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 time we call an improper payment, improper payment to a vendor, we can actually find the vendor, the date the payment was made, and go back and get it. But in the broader scheme, uh, the way we estimate errors is we pull a small sample size and we extrapolate that to a universe. So for Social Security, um, which could have a billion dollars in error. We don't know in every case that it was John Smith or Jane Smith that got the error. We pull a sample size with, let's say, 400 samples or 4,000 samples versus the actual 100,000 or 200,000 payments that were made. So we only know about the errors in the small sample size. Okay. And that's why. L let me just say to you, as somebody who ran a, a fairly large local government, um, uh, I, I don't think you make a lot of progress unless you make heroic goals, stretch goals. Two billion doesn't cut it. It is not sufficiently robust, in my view. I understand the limitations, but it is something I think we have got to come back to. Not, 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 when, not when the universe is $125 billion. Uh, Ms. Daly, you indicated that uh, Medicare prescription drug benefit Part D does not yet even track, but it is going to next year, improper payments. Is that correct? Congressman Colling, exactly. The pres Medicare Prescription Drug Benefit Program has actually done estimates on subsets mm -hmm. of its population, but does not have a total comprehensive estimate for that program. That yet. program has been in place now for how many years? I, I believe it was put in place in 2004, but I'm not certain. Okay, on so that. so we've got six or seven years of track record. That seems mm -hmm. awfully sluggish to me. Yeah. Uh, they've had plenty of time to get. Uh, get with the program, haven't they? Well, I think they have been trying to. As Mr. Werfel indicated, it is challenging to come up with a, a valid, comprehensive estimate for many of these programs. They are not always easy, easy to measure where the errors are occurring. Particularly with the donut hole, however, mm -hmm. um, it just lends itself to gaming. 
some of which would be illegal, uh, one thinks. Uh, and, and, and prescription drugs prices are all over the lot. You know, there are discount drugs and generic drugs and brand drugs and high expensive drugs and, you know, uh, orphan drugs and mm -hmm. generic, all kinds of other things. And uh, golly gosh darn, uh, it just seems to me that that's ripe for the picking. So I would hope that we're going to put a lot of heat on them to make sure they get this program up and running. Mr. Werfel, uh, uh, in terms of analytical tools, I was very intrigued by the Chairman's uh, uh, citation of uh, how credit cards clearly have a monitoring system for ourselves and our spouses, uh, and, uh, uh, and that we could learn a lot from the private sector. And I thought I heard you say we are doing that on a pilot basis. Uh, so I, I, I want to give you a, an opportunity of three things real quickly. One is how do we expand that beyond just the pilot so that we are actually using the expertise in the private sector in the public sector, given the amounts we are talking about? Secondly, uh, in terms of diagnostic tools, what are we doing on the diagnostic end to better uh, get a handle on what is the cause, a uh, more accurate cause of improper payments? And finally, what incentives are we providing for agencies to have a better track record than, say, for example, $2 billion out of $125? So on your first question, we have definitely moved beyond the pilot phase, but I don't think we are where we need to be. I think the private sector is way ahead of us in terms of leveraging the type of information networks to find anomalies and errors. But we have isolated examples of success stories. Uh, we have um, almost every agency has a forensic unit and, and some expertise in this area, and we have brought them together in a working group uh, recently to try to make sure that we are pushing ourselves to better and better things. But the examples I provided you are real. The Defense, Department re um, the, the Defense Department is one. They have a very sophisticated prepayment um, algorithm tool that they use that has eliminated something like or prevented a billion dollars in error over the last few years. The Recovery Board is real and it is happening today. And CMS's Fraud Lab is real and it is happening today. But the reality is, is that the, I would argue and my belief is that the credit card companies with the neural networks that they are developing are more sophisticated and ahead of us and we need to catch up. Your second question, I believe, was on diagnostics and root causes. I think we, th I think that is an area of real uh, progress that has been made since 2004. When we talk to agencies, it is not about a lack of understanding of what is causing the error. It is more around what are the appropriate solutions. And, and there are two things that drive our challenge on solutions. One is, do we have the information that we need? You know, and sometimes, whether it is the Privacy Act or just the lack of an automated tool to pull it, we don't always get the information we need to validate. And the second is, is that the tougher we make the world for recipients to prevent improper payments, it can create other programmatic challenges. And so, you know, I'm off, I often find myself in a meeting with an agency and I say, well, here's how you do it. Just create a policy that makes it much, much, much more difficult to get a, a payment error. And that tends to have reverberations around the rest of the program and could either create access barriers or create other complications. So it is like finding that right equilibrium. And I don't think I remember your third question. Yeah, if the Chair will indulge. The third question had to do, are the, are the right incentives in place for agencies to putting together robust and making this a priority? I think they need to be stronger. I mean, the IPERA is a great start with the compliance penalties, with the push to get this into performance appraisals. Um, I, I, you know, one thing that, that I think um, Chairman Platts referenced earlier was this, this audit situation. I am fond of saying that um, I don't, you are probably aware that on November 15th each year, agencies' financial statements are due out and their audits are due. And I always talk about that in the push to November 15th, it is remarkable how the agencies are so dedicated and working through the night, 3 a.m., it is 17 hours a day, and it is all this tremendous, intense push to get our financial statements out on time and to get them with clean audits. And I think if we can harness that energy, the accountability is there. The CFOs feel very, very, take it very, very personally if they don't get a clean audit opinion. It is a big deal. And if we can somehow harness that energy around this problem, I think you would see a tremendous change. And that is something that I want to promote with this subcommittee. I uh, th thank the gentleman um, for a yield. Mr. Ginta, just to follow on that is the um, uh, premise that uh, the audit of the 
internal controls that we required of DHS when we stood up DHS, uh, you know, was I, I believe one of the keys to them getting on a good track. And because, as as you referenced, somebody could get a clean opinion uh, on their annual audit, a department or agency, yet have a hundred billion of improper payments going out the door because the the audits that we're doing now don't go after identifying those uh, those improper payments. Just that they could account for the money, but not necessarily that it was properly spent. So with that, I uh, yield to the gentleman from New Hampshire, Mr. Ginta. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you both for your testimony. Can, first of all, the number $125 billion, how accurate is that number? And I know it is the reported number, but I'll, I will give I that to the auditor. I, <laughs> I, I know that is a reported number, but what would be your, your guesstimate of additional monies that we are not identifying? in overpayments or, or improper payments? Right. Well, that is the unknown answer, because we you know, have to wait until an empirically sound method is developed for providing an estimate. So right now, the best we know is that it is $125 billion for 2010. Uh, we do know there are at least seven major risk-susceptible programs that have not reported, but I can't give you a sense of how much those particular programs may have in improper payments or others where they may be tightening up their methodologies and moving forward that might provide a more precise estimate for programs that have already reported. That happened a year or so ago mm -hmm. with the Medicare fee-for-service program. They had uh, initially reported an estimate for 2009 of about $24 billion, and then applying a more stringent methodology raised that estimate up to about $35 billion. So that is a case where when they do a more precise estimate, they are able to identify what the various reasons and causes are. And I just wanted to, to add on to something that was discussed just a minute ago, if you don't mind, Congressman, that um, I, I do think that the estimates that, that are coming out are getting better, but it is also very important to have consistency in measuring also, because that way you are comparing apples to apples and you don't have the you know, differences in, and it may come about just because you are doing a different approach in your measurement. And then in the seven major uh, programs that are not reporting yet, which are the top two? Uh, Medicare prescription drug, and then there is, I, I believe, TANF would be the next largest dollar value program that okay. has not reported. So, and then over the last five years, mm -hmm. has this number been roughly the same, this $125 billion, or has it been progressively increasing? Mm -hmm. The number has been progressively increasing. Last year's estimate was $109 billion. Uh, prior to that, I'm going to have to check a cheat sheet if you don't mind. <laughs> I believe the number was 72 billion, and that is correct. It's about 72 billion in 2008, 55 billion in 2007. So we've, you know, seen a consistent progression upward. As Mr. Werfel indicated, a lot of that is because there are more programs more reporting every year. Right. Um, <clears throat> Can you, do you have a breakdown of how much would be Medicare and how much would be Medicaid? I, I, can, yeah. I can answer that question. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a very large portion. Um, in Medicare fee-for-service, um, $34.3 billion in error. In Medicare Part C, $13.6 billion. And in Medicaid, $22.5 billion. Um, and so that is, that is more than half our balance sheet on error just in Medicare and Medicaid alone. And is there ever a likelihood of us uh, achieving real, uh, real savings in these, in these three areas? When I, when I say real, I, I mean 70, 80, 90 percent? Uh, yes, uh, but it's, it's going to take time and it's going to take congressional help. For example, there is, uh, in the President's 2012 budget, we have a series of program integrity proposals uh, for, all pro for, for a variety of different programs. But on Medicare alone, our proposals, we believe, if enacted, would have the impact of saving $42 billion over 10 years. If you combine the legislative proposals we are seeking and some additional funds to do program integrity work, that, that not, doesn't get you to the 70 or 80 percent 
But again, this is, uh, we think, an extremely important step to be taken. W would you send some of those recommendations uh, to my office? And I don't know if other members would like them, but if, but if you would mind, I'd, I'd like to take a look at those. It would be my pleasure. Okay. Thank you very much. I yield back. Uh, thank the gentleman. I uh, yield to the gentleman, Mr. Lankford from Oklahoma. Thank you. And I would say to you as well, keep going. Obviously, there are a lot of people that are counting on you based on the budget and the American people that are looking forward to getting some of this cleared up over time. This has been an ongoing process. It is not a simple task by any means. We understand that. Um, but keep going <clears throat> with what you are doing. <clears throat> Excuse me. Mr. Werfel, uh, you know my propensity on some of the websites that we have uh, on the .govs. Can I just ask a quick question on the paymentaccuracy.gov? How is that connected? And are there other places that people can go to be able to find that and to be able to track it? And is the information connected to data.gov and other places, uh, as well as the, the agency's website as well, so it is easy to be able to identify and find? Well, that's a, that's a good question. Uh, first of all, I will say, you know, just to promote the, the website, paymentaccuracy.gov, we, we've been pleasantly surprised with the number of hits and, and foot traffic we get on the site. It's a well-visited site, and we're very excited about that. We have all kinds. I, I can't say that we have the perfect architecture of all the different links, but there are a lot of different opportunities to get there. In particular, it's USA. It's in it's in our USA Spending family, uh, and I would say that is probably our most visited website in this terrain. And so I think that's most critical. Okay, I would continue to encourage you to find a central portal that we can promote as a federal government and say, if you're looking for something, you can go here and get a chance to connect and jump off. And it's also searchable, so you can connect and it connects with all those different things rather than having to search in one and search in another and search in another one and be able to track it. Uh, the consequences for a uh, employee, vendor, or contractor that where we discovered an improper payment. How is that working? We talked about incentives. Obviously, we want incentives for the agency to be able to find it, to be able to reuse that money in other areas if it is done appropriately. What are the consequences that are coming down? Give me some examples of that. Well, I think the major consequence is that once a payment is identified as an error, uh, if, uh, and we identify the vendor uh, that received the error, if they don't pay the money back, uh, in a timely way, uh, we have a suite of different activities we can undertake to enforce that debt collection exercise. And one of the things that I am working to do with, uh, with the uh, procurement community is figure out are there additional uh, steps we can take. Um, you know, it's, it, the, you know, when we make a payment error to a vendor, uh, that is the United States making an error, and I believe the vendor has an obligation to report that error as soon as possible. Uh, and, um, and so we are looking at ways, uh, we haven't identified the perfect solution yet, but we are looking at ways to increase the vendor's responsibility to help in this, in this hunt for improper payment. There is both a balance in that, because I have talked to some vendors that um, a physical therapy clinic in Oklahoma City that I talked to not long ago that has had a longstanding battle uh, with uh, Medicare reimbursements where they will just get a random contact and say this was in inappropriate, and they pull their files and say, no, it was very appropriate, here is the code. I am sure that is being identified as inappropriate. They are telling me, no, I have the full verification. This is the right code. This is the right everything. H how are we hitting that balance between the two to where we are not having a, an individual vendor that is being crushed in the process and having to fight for a year to get the payment they deserve versus finding real fraud and saying, we have got to sniff this out? There has got to be a balance. You are hitting on the central issue, and I think I, I made this point in response to Congressman Connolly's question, is there is a tension. When I sit in a room with an agency, often I say, why can't we do this more aggressively? Why can't it be more comprehensive? You know, why are you waiting until you are 95 percent confident to go after an error? Why don't you go after it when you are 80 percent confident and we will we'll cast a wider net? And the issue is that it creates, creates more false positives. And it creates the potential for more litigation and inequity. And so the question is finding that right equilibrium and finding that right balance point. If there is some way to be able to notify a vendor that this is something that is suspicious, if you would provide us some simple kind of documentation to make sure we can clear that up, that would certainly help rather than the cutoff point of saying, okay, we think it is, you know, reimburse our money to us, pay us, whatever it may be, and it provides them some sort of interim step would be very helpful in that process. On both sides, obviously, we want to be able to tell people we are tracking it aggressively. If more people are getting that contact and saying we are watching, that helps. And if more people are finding out, oh, I better pull this and have my documentation in place, uh, that is a helpful thing. It, it is somewhat disturbing to hear about Medicaid dealing with $22 billion in this 
abuse, fraud, whatever it may be, whatever we're going to call it, uh, that's running 8, 10 percent of the Medicaid cost. That, that's a significant amount uh, that we're processing through, and I would encourage us in any way we can to continue to track that. Is there a single area that you can look at and go, this is the big issue with Medicaid and why we're having so much come out of it? Is there anything that comes to the top of that $22 billion? I don't know, Kay, if you want to take that one. Um, actually, the agencies reported that typically that for both Medicare and Medicaid, they have medical you know, necessity issues and trying to determine whether the medical procedure should have been performed. Oftentimes it is, as you mentioned, things like insufficient documentation is commonly reported also as one of the key causes of improper payments for those programs. Um, eligibility status is another one for Medicaid that you don't see, of course, for, for Medicare. So it's typically these are the causes that the agencies are reporting that are contributing towards those estimates of improper payments. Okay, and thank I, you. And I would just add one thing to that very quickly. The other challenge that HHS has on the Medicaid front is 50 different states running 50 different Medicaid type programs. So it is sometimes difficult to say, here is a unifying solution to our eligibility or a documentation problem, it doesn't always translate for every state. It doesn't mean that we, it just means we have to work harder in terms and get more granular in our solutions on a state by state basis. And I think CMS is doing that, but clearly at $22 billion, a lot more work. It's a lot of money. Well, I, I could just say on our side legislatively, we are working on correcting that uh, with the uh, budget that we are putting out today on the House floor. It block grants Medicaid back to the states and puts the accountability side on them. So dealing with 50 different states in that, we are trying to resolve that a very different way. So I appreciate that. And with that, I yield back. Uh, thank, thank, thanks, the gentleman. Uh, honored to be joined by the distinguished chair of the full oversight and government for a committee, the gentleman from California, I yield to Mr. Issa. I thank you, Chairman, and uh, I apologize for not being here for the whole subcommittee, but we are doing two at once, so I was over in national security. Uh, good morning. Uh, Mr. Werfel, uh, I sent you a letter about a month ago uh, that today happens to be miraculously the deadline that asked why, uh, what your policy was and the basis for not sitting on panels if they weren't to your liking. Uh, am I going to see that letter today? Yeah, I believe we are on track to get your response today. Yes. Today will end soon, you know. Uh, got, <laughs> okay, at, thank at you. O, at OMB, RCOB is, like, is later than, uh, than normal, but we will get you your response. Okay. And as you are finalizing it, since it is not yet here, understand that a longstanding policy for this committee is not the two years in which the Obama administration had the, your own party looking over your shoulder. It has to be a, a basis that would transcend any one administration. Otherwise, it is an administrative choice which is not acceptable to the other body that has the obligation for oversight. So hopefully your, your answer will be creative and maybe just a yes will come more often. Uh, <clears throat> you mentioned uh, uh, Mr. Langford uh, was asking about the false positives and so on. Two days ago, I was in front of one of the many groups we keep bringing in from AmericanJobCreators.com people who are talking about abuse within the Federal system, and uh, just on a somewhat related, talking about the checks and balances, the absence of the ability to track in real time uh, waste, fraud, and abuse, I asked them, because we were on the subject, I said, how many of you have received a call from Visa or MasterCard telling you that there is a suspicious problem? And virtually every hand went up. It was, it was probably 80 percent, at least. Then I asked how many of you had identity theft or your card actually stolen, and about four hands went up, one of whom was on my staff. The amazing thing was I asked if anyone was upset, and they said, of course not. Why? Well, because it reduces the cost of that card. The cost of cards, if it wasn't for the millions of false positives that are asked and, and explained, the, the cost of, uh, of those cards would go up by multiple percentage points because, as you know, MasterCard eats the losses. So my question to you is, why in the world wouldn't you develop a system that would allow you to basically be false positive 10 times, 20 times more often, ask the question, and in an analytical and inexpensive way, accept the answers and then sift through those answers? Why isn't that the approach, since it works for Visa and MasterCard in real time, and for us it doesn't work so well the way we are doing it? 
Uh, it's a it's a very good question. It's a challenging question, and I can assure you, Congressman, I am typically the person at the table pushing for a, a broader net and a more aggressive posture so that we can drive down errors. Uh, coming back at me across the table are very legitimate programmatic and policy concerns, in particular the concern that setting up these types of uh, of 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 internal controls and stop points or moratoriums on payments or keeping a payment from going out the door can create situations not only in which a, an eligible beneficiary is denied a payment, uh, but also can create the risk of litigation and due process that can slow the process down. Well, I will stop you for a second. Yeah. I would narrow my, my concern and request. Okay. Uh, unless they don't get answers after a period of time, your credit card doesn't actually get frozen. So let's go back again. Why wouldn't you send them out and expect responses and not, sh not necessarily shut off the payment, but simply increase, because so much of this to the physicians and others can be done electronically, why wouldn't you send out and only when there is a, a complete absence of response multiple times or, in other words, if you take what you are presently sending and you do stop if you don't get the answer you want and you add nine times more, but you don't stop except for the ones you are already stopping, all you are really doing is creating the alert, improving the system, uh, and, and of course eventually eliminating some of the false positives if you have a quality circle where you are learning from it. Why isn't that at least on a pilot basis on your radar screen to basically make Medicaid and Medicare oversight similar to, quite honestly, uh, credit card companies that can do this so automated and so efficiently? that you are talking about a fraction of the, of the fraud and a fraction of the cost? It is totally on our radar screen and it fits right into our strategic plan. Okay. Uh, then I am going to ask one more yep. because my time has expired and I want to be conscious that we also have a vote. Uh, the President's fiscal year 2012 budget uh, appears to me as though the, uh, the RAT Board success is being rolled into the Department of Treasury's Bureau of Public Debt for the creation of yet another new system. Why is it we would spend $10 million to take a program that has proven its successfulness because it didn't fall into Treasury's existing trap of what, what, what they actually makes health care reform look less complicated when you look at all the report froms and report twos? Why in the world would we do that? Isn't, isn't in fact, the RAT Board proof that you have to do it differently and not simply roll it into one more reporting? Mr. Daly, I think I will start with you on that because you know, from an efficiency standpoint, I think you see what we are getting to. Yes, Congressman. Uh, I am really not familiar with the particular proposal you are talking about, but I can say that the, the RAP Board did identify a number of very promising techniques that could and should be used throughout the government to try to help prevent improper payments. It's working. Well, I think I have got a couple of responses uh, to that, Congressman. Thank you for the question. And by the way, you do ask for more money to move it than it costs to produce it, just in case you were looking at the scale. <laughs> well, on the one hand, I will say that I have talked to Chairman Devaney about the possibility of defraying some of the costs by leveraging the hardware, software, and expertise that he has. But he is an independent entity, and I would never presume to, uh, to ask for the keys to his car. I, I want to make sure that he understands that we want to emulate what he is doing because it is a best practice and figure out the best way to emulate it. And if we can leverage his infrastructure to make our endeavor less expensive and he uh, would agree with that, that is definitely a path forward. In terms of Treasury, I think we can be extremely successful in deploying this technology at Treasury. Treasury makes almost all the payments for the Federal Government, ultimately. They take the information from the agency and they cut the checks, as I am sure you know. That means all this information is flowing centrally into Treasury, and they have what I believe to be the bench strength, the expertise, and the right network and relationship with the agencies to develop a, a very powerful fraud detection technology that can centrally utilize some of these credit card neural networks that you referenced earlier. We have to find a place for it, and it seems to me that finding the place where all the information converges before the payment goes out seems logical. Now, if there are concerns with Treasury in terms of their operations, 
let's, let's talk about them and let's sort through them and see if we can find corrective actions to them. But from a design standpoint, I, I, I think we have a strong argument around Treasury as being the right location. Very good. Mr. Chairman, uh, Chairman Devaney is, is told us that he is more than willing to meet with all the parties. I would suggest that a less formal environment with the chairman, members of our committee and staff, uh, and, and people from your organization might be the best way to, to strategize whether or not the keys to the car could be handed over in a more efficient fashion. Thank you, Chairman. Yield back. I thank the Chairman. And uh, certainly uh, that focus of, of uh, learning from what has been done and effective and then applying it in the best way is what we want to be about and, and appreciate the Chairman's participation uh, here today. Uh, yield to the gentlelady from the District of Columbia, Ms. Norton. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you for uh, this hearing. Um, uh, I, I note a, a, a great deal of executive action, and after all, these are uh, agencies under the control of the President. An executive order in November uh, 2009, um, a, another memorandum on, on finding the payments in, in March 2010, followed in June by what I really like, a, a, a do not pay list. Um, uh, is this the first time there has ever been an executive order on, on this subject? Uh, Congresswoman, yes, it is good to see you again. Yes, uh, this is the first executive order that I am aware of that is dedicated to, uh, to this problem. I, I think, as you just noted, um, I have served under multiple presidents. Uh, and I have never seen this level of attention to the improper payments problem from coming from a president. This looks like a real focus uh, that has been continuous and systematic. It is, frankly, very impressive, uh, particularly considering how difficult it is to recoup money um, if you are uh, if, if, if somebody writes you and says uh, that uh, some agency writes you and says they have overpaid you, like the IRS, and they say they want their money back, that is enough to send you up the wall. Uh, um, so I, I, I am certainly satisfied that we have for the first systematic effort to do something about uh, a problem that is, to say the least, uh, uh, elusive and difficult uh, because you have to deal after the fact. It is a terrible position, but when you see the government, how large it is, it is inevitable, it is absolutely inevitable that there would be uh, overpayments. I was, I, I'm always interested in, in the cause uh, because prevention seems the best strategy. And I, I, I'm sure I've, I've missed and you may have spoken of the causes. I just want, based on uh, some of the figures uh, uh, I, I have uh, from OMB, uh, uh, to ask you about improper payments. Um, when one looks comparatively, and of course we are looking at very different agencies, so, because therefore there must, there may, I don't know, um, um, how to evaluate uh, the, the different agencies. Um, but for example, you have um, Medicare fee for service, and uh, improper payment amounts, 34. Uh, point three, it looks like billion. Uh, then you have something, and that's uh, a rate of ten point five zero percent. And so, that when I first saw that, I, I thought, well, the, the money goes through so many hands. <laughs> Maybe that's what it has to do with. Then I looked at uh, the national school lunch program, where I don't think anybody has to put up any money. And that rate of overpayment was 16.3, uh, 16.30 percent. So I, I'm, I was trying, <laughs> I'm trying to, 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 to get a grip on uh, some, <laughs> some um, anchor factor that may, uh, in fact, lead to overpayments. Uh, because if you trace that back, maybe you'd know how to prevent it. Do you have any insights into why, for example, school lunch would have such a, a very much greater overpayment um, uh, percentage than 
Medic uh, Medicare fee for service. Uh, Congressman, certainly this is something that we've uh, that we've studied very closely to try to understand the root causes, uh, and I think we're in a good place right now. Uh, to understand those root causes, our challenge has been finding the right solutions. But to answer your question directly, um, eligibility is a key issue across the board for programs generally, confirming eligibility. And eligibility is often driven by factors, as I am sure you know, what the household size is, what their adjusted gross income is, uh, what their assets are in order to determine whether they are the right uh, population to receive this particular uh, income maintenance or social benefit. It is no different in school lunch. And uh, we have a lot of school districts with a variety of different procedures in place to make sure that the right kids are receiving subsidized or free mm -hmm. and reduced pr uh, price lunches. When we go in and we audit it, we find that, um, that overpayments are made in the form of uh, a greater uh, population of children receiving the school lunch subsidy than otherwise would if the, if the requirements were technically followed. Um, and, um, and, and so the U.S. Well, can, that, that, that's, uh, that, that's very helpful. You, would, uh, you, you see the low rates for um, uh, disability insurance. Um, uh, the the low rate certainly, uh, for example, um, for um, that that's the Social Security Administration. Correct. Po uh, point five zero oh percent per, uh, percent there. Um, um, does that have to do with experience? Uh, does that have to have to do with with what it takes to qualify? Because you would think that the same would be be in terms of qualifications being so nailed down. The same would be be the case for Medicare fee for service. We know, you know, how you you know you got to. We know exactly who those people are or aren't. Uh, so does it does that have to do again with the hands through which it goes and the and and the providers? Uh, whereas with disability insurance, you have a very low rate, uh, uh, which perhaps goes through less hands or fewer hands. It's a very good question, Congresswoman. I think the key, my my answer to that question is, Social Security is the Social Security Administration has a direct connection to the beneficiary it's paying. There's the, the process is, is one straight line from the, the, the Social Security Administration determining eligibility to the payment, and it is a unified system throughout. Whereas school lunch, it is 50 different states, different State Departments of Education, different school but districts. But Medicare fee for service, uh, you, you would think that there is a straight line there between, I don't know, the physician or whoever gets the money. <laughs> State or whoever. That Medicare is, is, a very, is, is unique in terms of one of the major drivers of error is a, it's a cousin of eligibility, it's medical necessity. And so what happens very what, Medicare is probably the most challenging of all the programs, because what happens is, for example, a patient comes in and the doctor makes a decision on the spot to keep that patient overnight. But when you go back and look at it, Medicare only would have reimbursed for, for an outpatient uh, experience. And that, and that is about training doctors and figuring out better how to understand the decisions that are made. It is an enormously complex challenge because it is very difficult to validate medical necessity in real time. And that is why you see such high numbers in Medicare. And uh, I apologize to the gentlelady, but I have to run uh, to the floor. <laughs> Your graciousness, Mr. Chairman. Because yeah, uh, uh, as we have seen here on both sides, uh, tremendous interest in the, in the issue. Um, and I, I want to wrap up here quickly um, that one of the things Mr. Langford, when he talked about block granting Medicaid, in essence, you know, I know it is a controversial issue, but it is to go after the issue of saying to the States, all right, we are going to give you a block grant of money so that then they buy in and have much greater incentive to go after improper payments than today when we are paying 57 percent, they are paying 43. They have a less of an incentive as to when it is their own money, uh, in essence. And, and so you know, I think that is what Mr. Lankford, to go after, like school lunch, where it is local verification, well, if we are paying the bill, they are not as concerned about verifying because we are paying the bill. 
Um, the bottom line is we want to work with you, with the administration, both sides of the aisle here with the committee, and, and really partner with you, whether it is legislation. I know Mr. Towns and Mr. Connolly both have talked to me about partnering with me. I think Mr. Lankford and others on, on this side uh, want to work with you on legislative fixes that we need to help you go to the, the next step. Also, how we can partner with the administration on getting Department of Transportation, the Postal Service to comply with the original Improper Payments Act, to adequately identify you know, the possible risk. Uh, any way that we can work together, bottom line, is to identify improper payments and then how to solve preventing them in the long term or recovering them when they are made, we want to do so. Uh, we appreciate both of you being here, great expertise. Uh, Mr. Werfel, um, you know, I know uh, on the hot seat a little bit here, but we are glad to have the partnership we have with you uh, and uh, your office and look forward to continuing that and working very closely with you. So we are going to keep the record open for, uh, for seven days for any additional information you want to provide or any statements that members want to submit. Uh, for the record, we thank you for your testimony. This hearing stands adjourned.